Uh, today is March 8, 2020. My name is David Perez, and I'm conducting an interview with Miguel Guzman for Voces of Mariachi Project, part of the Voces Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. We're in San Antonio, Texas, at the University of Texas at San Antonio's downtown campus. Thank you, Mr. Guzman, for sharing your perspective with us today. Before we start, um, we want to make sure that we tell you that your unedited interview will be housed at the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection and will be open to the public. So if there's anything you don't want to discuss, um, you're under no obligations to discuss it. Also, if there's anything you wish to discuss, please make sure to get it discussed. Please know that if you wish to stop the interview to use the facilities or for any other reason, we can do that. Um, so let us begin. Um, Miguel, can you tell me a little bit uh, about your childhood? Yes, I was born in San Antonio. Uh, my parents uh, lived in uh, the west side of San Antonio. And um, my parents got divorced when I was seven years old. From there, we lived with my um, paternal grandparents. And uh, it was a, a, a good experience. We, it was a humble home. Uh, my grandmother raised 13 children and after her 13 children, she took in five of, of uh, or actually it was five of us, uh, me and my siblings. And, um, you know, we, uh, we lived uh, a, a normal childhood, I guess, or we, no nos faltaba nada. We, you know, we had everything that we needed, uh, especially love. And there was always music in the home. My grandfather played guitar. And as a child, I always remember listening to him play. His name's Rufino Guzman. He played guitar, and uh, any gatherings we had at the house, Christmas gatherings, or you know, any time we had anyone come over, my grandfather would play guitar. And I always loved listening to him play. Uh, as I grew up uh, to about 10 years old, 11 years old, entering middle school, I. I wanted to pursue uh, a sport, you know. I love playing out on the street, you know, with my neighborhood friends. And I was going to enter Rhodes Middle School in the SAISD. And my grandmother, I told my grandmother, I want to, I want to join football. And she said, "Well, uh, I think that's a bad idea. You know, one of your uncle's friends broke his collarbone and got paralyzed, and blah blah blah." So I. There's a trumpet in the closet somewhere. One of your uncles had a trumpet. And we're going to send it to the repair lab and then uh, get it to you, and you're going to join the band. I said, what? <laughs> I, I really didn't want to join the band. And then I started thinking about it. I said, well, I kind of I like music, but I want to play the saxophone. She said, no, you're playing the trumpet. So good thing I listened to my grandmother. Her name's Adelina. And... Uh, so yeah, I joined the band in middle school and, and started playing the trumpet in middle school. But around that same time, I started picking up some things from my grandfather playing guitar. Uh, so I'd ask him, uh, how do you play you know, this song? And uh, he'd show me and I asked him, well, what's the name of the chord or what's the name? He said, I don't know, it's just primera, segunda, and tercera. He just learned by, by ear, by rote what we call by rote. So he didn't, have a, he didn't have any musical training or musical background. Uh, so as I continued studying in middle school, I started learning about the notes, the names of the notes, note values, and so forth, you know, music theory uh, at that level. So I started, you know, I was interested in playing the guitar a little bit more. At the same time I was playing trumpet, uh, my grandmother was a devout Catholic, so of course we would go to church every Sunday. And at the church, they had a church choir at San Juan de los Lagos in the West Side. Um, there was a, a family, La Familia Rosas. Carlos Rosas was a musical director there. And uh, he had five sons as well. And all of his sons were basically the, like we were in around the same age. And they were playing in the choir. And my grandmother said, I want you to join the Rosas boys and help them out or help us out and, and I want you to play in the church choir. I said, well, I don't like the Spanish music. You know, I was listening to 99.5 Kiss and I was listening to Led Zeppelin and, you know, all, all that rock music in, in those days. 
Um, so I decided, well, I have to listen to my grandmother. And so I started attending some of these rehearsals for the church choir and I played trumpet with, with the church choir for every Sunday we were, we were there. And that's like pretty much where I started playing music <coughs> at church. You know, so my childhood consisted of that, you know, going to school, coming home, practicing, going to church on the weekends. And that was, you know, the, the, the basics of it, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So it sounds like your grandfather was your inspiration for music? Uh, so yeah, of course. I can say that. Yeah. Did, uh, did that pass on to any of your siblings? Mm, you know, my sisters tried uh, when they were in high school you know, picking up the violin, but it, you know, they just played there for a, for a year or so, but they didn't continue with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when was your, uh, when was your first experience with uh, mariachi music? With mariachi music? Well, um, all this time we were playing like uh, church hymns or, or, you know, at the mass church, church songs. Um, for mariachi music, it wasn't until I entered high school. I was uh, at Lanier High School, and I was playing trumpet in the band. And one of my companions, his, his name's David Villarreal, and uh, he was in the band also. And he uh, mentioned that they had a mariachi program at the school. He said, would you like to join the mariachi program? <clears throat> um, and at that time, I said, you know what? Uh, I don't, I don't it's not the music that I listen to. He said, come and give it a try. We need a second trumpet player. We need another trumpet player. So I said, well, I'll go and check it out. So yeah, we just walked into the next room and they had a mariachi group there, a small ensemble. Uh, the director of the mariachi is Juan Ortiz. And um, Juan Ortiz was um, the mariachi director there. And she said, hey, welcome to our class. And you know, we understand that you play trumpet and uh, we need a trumpet player because we're getting ready for a competition. And uh, I said, sure, I mean, yeah. So they have sheet music and of course, by then I could read music, uh, notation. And they were playing two selections. And so we start playing and I'm reading the music and I said, hey man, this is pretty neat. You know, I like this. And uh, after the rehearsal, we were done and he said, uh, so what did you think? I said, well, I don't know, let me think about it. So a week passed and they're like, David said, hey, so what's up, man? Are you gonna join or what? I said, yeah, let's go. Well, let's get together and practice. So we did, we practiced, <clears throat> excuse me. We practiced uh, the, the songs that we had to play and then we went to this contest for UIL and we went up to state uh, for UIL competition with the mariachi. So that was the first experience with mariachi playing. It was through through the high school at Lanier High School mm -hmm. with okay. Juan Ortiz. Nice. So aside from, aside from the uh, mariachi uh, program at Lanier, mm -hmm. I mean, what's, um, was there any other influence on the west side of San Antonio at that time? Um, well, it was just church, you know, the Carlos Rosas and, and uh, his family, you know, playing at church on Sundays and other influences. It's, you know, my grandfather playing guitar on the weekends and, or, you know, family gatherings and so forth. Okay, mm -hmm. so once once you actually learned to read um, read music, mm -hmm. um, did you and your grandfather kind of collaborate on yeah, that? Yeah, a little. Yeah, that's that's funny though because then I would go back and tell him, look, this is this is G. What you're playing here, this is G. I said, oh, pues es primera, and uh, D seven is segunda, and then I would say, okay, tercera is C, and he, I mean he he played the way he played it either way, but you know now I could you know, we could relate a little bit more. We had that connection. It was a lot better. Okay. Yeah. So sounds like a great relationship with him. Mm -hmm. um, what about, what about your grandmother? I know you said she raised a mm -hmm. home full of kids. What, yeah. what was that relationship like? Oh, she was an angel, man, you know, and I deserve, I mean, I, everything that I did from that point on, it was because of her, you know, her vision and saying, you know, I want you to go to church and play with the church choir and you're going to play this instrument and good thing that I did you know, obey her, her commands, you know, uh, but she was an angel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every, er, anything that I needed at, from that point on, she was, she supported me a hundred percent. You know, she bought me my, and, and this is one thing that amazes me because, you know, we're, it's a lot of people living in that little house and a lot of mouths to feed. And when I came into high school, 
I, I had that old trumpet my, my uncle had when, when I entered middle school, but when I entered high school, you know, that's another level. So my grandmother went to Alamo Music downtown and she bought me a, a brand new Stradivarius trumpet, a Bach, a Bach Stradivarius 37, Model 37. And um, that was about $915 back in 1984. So that's a lot of money. So she, I don't know how she managed to save that money and go and pay it cash. And so that was, that was something for me, you know, for her to make that sacrifice. You know, she had other people, other mouths to feed, like I said, and for her to make that sacrifice and, and buy me that trumpet. So yeah, I, I, w I would take care of that instrument and I would go home and practice. And, and I had a, a sense of responsibility now. I had, I, I felt, you know, that, I don't know. I, I just felt I, uh, that I had to do something with that. That sounds like she was a very big supporter. Oh, yes, she was. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, an article online mentions mariachi music kept you fr um, from going gang life. Can you elaborate <laughs> on that? The area where I, wor where I lived was, was tough, man, you know. Uh, my uncles, and, and this is one thing, my, my grandmother always um, talked to me in reference to, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the society that we were living in, uh, the area that we were living in. We lived in the, in the west side of San Antonio, and, and um, we lived on Montezuma Street. Montezuma is one street away from Guadalupe Street. Guadalupe Street was known for prostitution for cantinas for drug you know uh, activity and and um, it, it's easy to fall into into that line of things you know my my uncles um, you know they they suffered a lot because they fell into those traps you know <clears throat> my uh, some of them were in and out of jail so this was always a, a, a reminder. My grandmother said, you have to go to church. Don't do the same things your, your uncles did, you know. You want to make sure you go to school, make sure, you know, do this and that and, you know, serve them in the military. And she always wanted the best for us. <clears throat> uh, like I tell you, she was an angel. And, uh, yeah, the gangs and drugs and everything else that involves that, you know, it, it was around us. It was... It was in my home, you know. My, my father passed away when I was 16, mm, around 16 or so, yeah. Uh, my father was 35 years old. He died from a heroin overdose. So, you know, all those things, uh, trying to stay away from that. But music kind of kept me away from that type of lifestyle, you know. Uh, I, I experienced, you know, you know, using drugs in the in the earlier days of my my life. You know, as a as as young as middle school, you know, there was um, drugs uh, accessible uh, through the area that we lived in. You know, it was so common. Um, <clears throat> so that was that was a difficult part. You know, and then you associate that drugs with gangs and so forth. But once we started doing music, you know, it kind of veered me away from, from that type of lifestyle, you know. Uh, it helped me stay focused a little bit more on, on positive things, you know. Not that there's not drugs and, and alcohol and, and mariachi or, or, or music, but it, for me, it, it just staying away from that area, you know, kind of helped me, helped me uh, not fall into those traps. I, yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think, I mean, why do you think your grandmother pushed music instead of, you know, maybe going towards sports or something else? Um, I don't know, man. I mean, she was part of the, the church choir as well. So we had that connection. We would go to church together and we'd stay for church practices. And after that, we go out and eat, you know, after church, eat a menudo or a taco de barbacoa. And we'd sit down and talk. And more than anything, we talk about those things, about my future. He, she would always, you know, um, <clears throat> she had a soft spot for me, you know. And I, I can honestly say that, you know. But she would always uh, try to groom me and say, you know, these are the right things to do and so forth. Mm -hmm. Sounds like an amazing lady. Yes.
Um, okay. So, who do you uh, who do you actually consider your biggest um, influences musically? Oh man, that's that's so broad. <laughs> that that question is so broad. You know, because there's um, there's so much music that inspired me. You know, of course, the beginnings were were at church. You know, I I also. I was playing with a church choir, but at the same time, I was also um, doing the youth choir, and that was the English mass. I was serving as a as a altar boy, you know. So I would I, we would serve the the Saturday mass uh, on Saturday evenings, like at six, and then the following morning, I have to be at church by seven o'clock to ring the bells, seven thirty mass. I'd serve the Mass. At 10 o'clock, I would play the 10 o'clock Mass, the Spanish Mariachi Mass. At 12 noon, I would sing with the youth choir. And, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty, pretty much how the music just was part of my life at that point. Uh, influential, you know, my gra I'd always seen my grandfather play, of course. But then we started uh, looking into mariachi music. I know uh, Juan Ortiz was the director at at Lanier and he kind of you know showed introduced me to mariachi music you know he said this is an album of mariachi Vargas at Tecalitlan this is the world's greatest mariachi and I want you to check it out you know so yeah I go home and listen to it and it's like oh man I listened to that thing over and over and then um, sometime during halfway through the year he said oh by the way there's a mariachi festival that's come in uh, in April, and uh, Mariachi Vargas is coming. I said, "What? You know, this is amazing. Let's check them out." And sure enough, we got to meet Mariachi Vargas. And listening to Mariachi Vargas for the first time, I took a boombox with a cassette, and you know, play, press record, and play at the same time, and recorded their concert playing. And this was back in 1984, you know, and listening and looking at Mariachi Vargas uh, in a close proximity you know that was incredible man and then getting to meet them and know them and and you know I know I, I knew them by name already because I look at the album and I knew who who this was and I knew who, who the guitarronista was and the trumpet players were and so getting to meet them that was a really inspirational time in my life for a turning point I guess for to continue playing mariachi music you know the the stereotypical thought was mariachi is just a bunch of fat you know drunk men singing and cantinas and part of it might be true but <laughs> but <clears throat> this changed everything this was musical this was beautiful arrangements you know harmonies and and uh, <clears throat> the way they presented themselves their attire their traje de charro their everything was incredible you know so it was that was inspirational mariachi vargas has to be the biggest influence in in oh, any mariachi musician there there's that's out there okay um when did you when did you actually decide you wanted to be a mariachi man i don't know man i don't know if i there was ever a point where i really w decided and say okay i want to be a mariachi but but that was the last thing in my mind you know my grandmother and grandfather always wanted me to pursue engineering or you know architecture she said you know you want to aim high and I want you to study and that kind of you know plans didn't work out the way they wanted they want they always wanted for me to continue my education and and so forth and <clears throat> mariachi kind of oh, it helped me in the in the sense not to get involved more like in drugs and and gang relations and stuff like that but more like you know doing positive things but that kind of threw me off my track of becoming an engineer or an architect, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So I know, I know you had mentioned that your grandfather was, you know, into music, of mm -hmm. course. Um, and you said your siblings kind of dabbled in it mm -hmm. a little bit here and there. Um, I mean, how did, how did they feel about you, you know, pursuing this, though? Um, it's like everybody had their own thing, man, you know. There were so many people in, in, in the house at, at some point, and it's like, you know, if you're not getting into trouble, I think you're doing okay, you know. So I kind of fell through the cracks sometimes, and they didn't know where I was at points. But they knew I was doing music, so that was okay, you know. So they didn't, you know, press too much on 
on anything else. You're not getting into trouble. You're not in jail. You're alive. You're okay. You know, so they kind of just left me at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, what about uh, people your age? I mean, what was their view on mari uh, mariachi groups at that time? Mm, it was fairly new, man. You know, like my friends were all listening to, you know, rock, Metallica, and things that were coming out, new stuff. So to to be able to play mariachi music, it was kind of different, you know, back then. Uh, nowadays, it's everything's changed. You know, they have mariachi programs all over the the state, all over the United States. It's part of the curriculum in the public schools and back then it was it wasn't as popular i guess uh but i felt you know honored to be part of that boom or that growth you know considering that mariachi uh education was started here in san antonio back like in 1979 by bell ortiz and juan ortiz from campanas de america and i was uh part of that family also when i started playing mariachi music in high school from there with Juan, I'm sorry, from after, you know, playing with Juan for a couple of times um, in the high school group at Lanier, you know, I would grab another instrument, you know. I was um, inquieto. I don't know what this, the word is, inquieto in, in English. Um, I just was all over the place, right? And I would pick up an instrument and try to dabble with it. And, and one time I picked up a violin and he, he, he told me, hey, you know, you look like, n you look natural the way you're playing. Uh, have you ever thought about playing violin? I said, no, not really. He said, well, I have an instrument at home and uh, a method book if you want to swing on by and pick it up and you can start, you can, I can teach you how to play violin. I said, well, okay. So I took, his, took, up a, took him up on his word and, and he lived like three blocks away from Lanier. So after school, I walked over to his house and uh, his wife was there, and that was one of the first times I met Belle. And I entered their home, and uh, Juan answered, hey, this is Mike Guzman. My name is Miguel, but they knew me. Everybody called me Mike. He said, uh, this is Mike Guzman, and uh, he is uh, a mariachi student at Lanier. He's our trumpet player, but he, he is going to be the next violinist for Campanas de America. I said, what? You know, we hadn't spoken a word about Campanas or anything like that. That was his professional group outside from the school. And Bell was, oh, that's wonderful, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, great. And I was like, what's happening here, you know? So I picked up that violin. I went home, opened the method book, started practicing. And I learned, I think, two songs, two mariachi songs. And within a month, I was playing with Campanas de America in a month of playing violin. I knew two songs. You know, I wasn't a pro, of course, but uh, the two songs that I learned, I, that's how I learned how to play. Uh, eventually, a couple of months later down the road, um, I was in search of a, of a, a violin teacher. Uh, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about technique and, and the basics of, of violin um, <clears throat> as a foundation. So I did... Um, my research and somehow I got connected to Genaro Ibarra. He's a, a violinist that worked for the symphony, the San Antonio Symphony. And uh, he lived a couple of blocks from my house. So I approached him and I talked to him. I had an interview with him. He was very formal. He was an ex-army uh, serviceman and uh, he played in the army band as a clarinetist and then as a director for the, for the band in the army. But he also played the violin very well, and he was a, a symphony player for the San Antonio Symphony. So we agreed to, he agreed to take me on as a student, and uh, he would charge me $15 per lesson. And those $15 were, was money that I had to come up with. I didn't ask my grandmother. So uh, any gigs or anything that I did, I, I was able to you know, save up to pay for my own lessons. And that's how I started playing and learning, not necessarily mariachi music, but learning more about the instrument in, in the classical sense. You know, etudes and, uh, you know, violin technique and reading skills and exercises, scales and so forth, more in the classical uh, form. And, uh, but he was a tough teacher. 
You know, he was, uh, I, like I said, ex-military. He was a very formal and, and very respectful man, older man. And um, so I remember one of, the, one of my biggest experiences with him was attending um, one of the rehearsals. And I get, I get to, to the rehearsal and I get out my instrument and start practicing. Okay, let's review this, what we had for homework. And I kind of like stumbled through stuff because I didn't practice, you know. And uh, he said, okay. Put your instrument away uh, and don't waste my time. If you're not practicing, go home. I don't need your money. He said, I don't need your money. And I just like, oh, my goodness, got my violin and left like uh, like my tail be <laughs> between my legs, you know, because I was, you know, nobody had talked to me in that in that fashion before. But it was a good a good experience for me, for him to be, you know, my grandmother was the sweetest thing. You know, she wouldn't. You know, whatever I needed, she was there for me. But for somebody to tell me, hey, I don't need your money, go. And it's like, oh, my God, you know. So that was eye-opening. So I went, what did I do? Go home and practice and, and prepare. It helped me prepare myself better, you know, and not take things for granted. And, and that, that, was, that was my teacher, Genaro Ibarra. I continued to study with him for a couple of years through high school and then uh, kind of left that for a while. But I, by that time, I was already playing with Campanas de America, playing mariachi music. And at that time, they, they were super busy. We, we had lots of fun experiences and great experiences with Campanas, playing with them. And having that connection with Mariachi Vargas de Tecalitlan was, was also something very special because those were our teachers, you know. Uh, we talk about mariachi education nowadays. Now you can attend the university and play at the universities and even, you know, get uh, a, a music degree on concentration on mariachi. But back then, that wasn't it. You know, back then it was, you know, what you knew. And the good thing about it is that connection we had through Juan and Bell that we were able to talk to mariachi Vargas, you know, and, and see them in a personal you know, uh, level and, and ask them questions, you know, how do you play this or what do you think about this? And, and they would give us tips and pointers and as far as I was concerned. And you're talking about the world's greatest mariachi. So what else could you ask for? You know, that was an awesome experience right there. You, um, you had mentioned some great experiences with your, uh, with your first group, Campanas. Uh-huh, Campanas. Could you elaborate on this? Oh, yeah. I mean, we had we we try I, I was with campanas for about seven years and through that we did numerous recordings you know uh, so that was like one of the first times i had experiences in in a, in a studio to play and record something which is a a whole different game you know you can play live and play for in front of people and stuff like that but once you get into a studio every detail is is uh exposed you know, your intonation, your phrasing, you know, every little scratch you can hear, you know, your strings vibrate. Everything is so different. So that was, you know, my first experiences with Campanas was recording, of course, performing. We had the opportunity to <clears throat> travel. One of, the, one of the first experiences we had was traveling to Los Angeles, California for some mariachi festivals that were fairly new to, to all these mariachi festivals that exist nowadays. But, you know, we had the experience to meet up with, uh, of course, Mariachi Vargas, and there was like Mariachi Los Camperos, uh, based out of Los Angeles, Mariachi Los Galleros. Those were the top hitters in those conferences. And, and we were like flying underneath the radar because we were like starting out, but, you know, they took us in as well. Like, you know, they, they saw that we wanted to learn and continue to, um, to progress in that music. And one of the directors, his name's uh, Natividad Cano, Nati Cano, he's a director for Mariachi Los Camperos. And he saw like this young group of 17, 18, 16 year old, you know, mariachi uh, kids, you know, young men, you know, that were eager to learn. And, and, uh, and one of those conferences that we had, or he was here in San Antonio, he came to us and said, hey, you guys are playing great, blah, 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 but, you know, try playing it this way. And uh, why don't you do this when you're playing, you know, uh, give it this emphasis, you know. And those are the little te technical things that, 
that uh, that we some some groups lack. You know, what's missing from this group uh, compared to this group? Well, those are the details. And he said, whenever any any one of you guys want to learn the style of mariachi, los camperos, or the style that we play, you're more than welcome to come and, and study with us. I said, oh man, that's pretty awesome, you know, for somebody to open their doors to you. And uh, oh, man, I said, man, that sounds like a great opportunity. So what did I do? I get a plane ticket and go to Los Angeles. I fly myself out to Los Angeles. This was before cell phones, before GPS, before, you know, all this stuff. So I get to Los Angeles and I'm like, okay, now what do I do? How do I get to La Fonda restaurant de los Camperos? I'm like, I don't know. So I don't know how I took a shuttle. I don't know how I, somehow I arrived to La Fonda, you know. And uh, once I arrived and he's like, hey, Miguel, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I, came, I took up your work. Oh, this is awesome. Come on. So Nati introduced me to their music director. She said, Juan Jose, mira, this is Miguel from San Antonio. Plays with Campana de América, de San Antonio. And he came, he's here for, I don't know how long you're going to be here, but go get him a, a traje and suit him up. So I, once I entered the restaurant, they took me into a warehouse in the back, and they had a, a warehouse full of mariachi trajes. Okay, they're wearing this one today, so they gave me a traje. And from 30 minutes from when I entered the door, I was already on stage playing with Los Camperos. You know, I didn't, I didn't know their songs, but I followed them as much as I could, the best as I could. And I studied with them for, uh, well, I stayed with them for, for some time there, for a couple of days or a, a week or two weeks. And what Nati had me do, he said, okay, mira, Miguel, uh, go with Juan Jose. This is our musical director. Juan Jose, llévate a Miguel contigo. And so I would go to Juan Jose's house, and I would practice with him. You know, and I'd eat with his family and spend time with them. And the next day, he said, okay, Chewy, you llévate a Miguel contigo. And I go to practice with Chewy. Chewy, okay, Mario, Mario Rodriguez, orale, ve y practica con Miguel. And, uh, or Miguel, ve y practica con ellos. And so I was learning from these master mariachi experts. You know, they, they had an incredible group. And they, they have, like, one of the highest standards of, of mariachi music. Uh, you know, performance levels, uh, expertise and experience and, and professionalism. So I was learning from these um, <clears throat> professionals at that point. Uh, so I had that wonderful experience that kind of connected me to Los Camperos. From Los Camperos, uh, by that point, I, I was already getting ready to graduate from high school. I was entering San Antonio College. I had already um, registered, and Nati told me, so what are you doing? I said, well, I just registered. I'm going to San Antonio College in the fall. He said, okay, great. Finish school, and once you're done with school, give me a call. He said, so you have a foot in the door. That was back in 87, 87, 88. And um, sure, so I came back home and started going attending SAC, and and then uh, a couple of years passed, and I was playing. I was still playing with Campanas. Uh, back around 1989, we had a contract with SeaWorld, um, and they had a mariachi dinner show, Fiesta Mexicana, and they had the mariachi. They had a charro rope artist. They had um, a singer, two singers. Oh, a singer, and uh, her name was Esmeralda. She was a a ranchera singer, and we we started. Uh, we would accompany her, and we would accompany the the uh, the charro and the ballet folklorico, and it was a beautiful show. Well, I met Esmeralda at, at that point, <clears throat> and then that was during the summer. We would play uh, like I don't know how many days out of the week. So I go back to school to SAC, and I enter my music literature class, and as I enter, Esmeralda's there. I said, "Hey." good to see you so I sit next to her and we're chatting and then you know we talk after class and she's like hey uh, so what are you doing later you know <laughs> <laughs> no eventually we started dating and uh, about a, a year and a half after that 
And yeah, so that was my wife. That's how we met. I met my wife through, through the mariachi experiences that I had through music. But she was, a, uh, by then, she was already a well-renowned uh, singer. Uh, but yeah, that's how I met my wife, through, through, the, through the mariachi experiences that we had. So by that time, I'm like, okay, uh, I don't think I'm going back to Los Angeles, you know, with Los Camperos. So, so we got married, we had one kid, and I said, okay, we're getting ready to trans. Uh, we wanted to go up to UNT. Um, and, uh, you know, now she's expecting our first child. And she said, well, okay, let's take a break from school for one semester so we can have, so you can have the baby. So that happened. And, you know, a couple of, you know, while that's happening, then I get a call again from Nati or his, one of his musical directors, Chewy, and says, hey, we have a conference up in Fresno, California. Would you help us out with this conference? And I said, sure, you know, play at the concert and teach some of the classes. And so, so they flew me into Los Angeles and I started, you know, working with them in that sense. So I would fly back and forth, commute, you know, whenever they had big shows and concerts. And we did that for about close to 10 years with Los Camperos going and traveling and doing concerts all over California, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Mexico, Guadalajara, Spain, Madrid. So that was, that was a lot of uh, beautiful experiences that I've had. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it. Sounds like you owe a lot to uh, mariachi music, mm -hmm. actually. Yes, sir. Um, so going back to those first um, those first groups back in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. then, um, you said that they provided you with your traje. Yeah. Was that your first traje that they gave? Oh no no no! They had like a warehouse of trajes. They're just here. Use this one, and I mean, I have to give it back to them. But they had a whole warehouse of different trajes. Okay. Do you do you remember how old you were when you got your first? My first traje mm -hmm. in mariachi. It must have been like when I was in the ninth grade, you know. I was, well, how old are you in the ninth grade? Pff, I don't know, fourteen, <laughs> I guess. Do you uh, do you remember what they cost back then? Um, I sure don't, man. But they get pretty pricey, you know. It depends on how elaborate they are, uh, what kind of design you get, the the material. So a traje can cost anywhere from, you know, three hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, you know. Then, in addition to you know your belt, your buckle, your sombrero, your moño, everything is money. Everything is money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now these uh, these groups that were in LA that you were playing with, mm -hmm. um, were there a lot of women in these mariachi groups no. back then? No. Mm -hmm. Maybe one one girl in the in the mariachi group. Now there's you know female groups all over the place. Yeah. Do you uh, do you remember when that? started to change or transition uh, into? I sure don't, man. It must have been about, I guess, 20 years ago. You know, nothing against women playing mariachi music, but, you know, it wasn't as um, popular, I guess. But now, you know, you see mariachi female groups all over the place, you know. The majority of uh, my students are female nowadays in the schools. Yeah, I think they had, we have more females in mariachi than male you know, nowadays, which is pretty awesome. No, I agree. I definitely agree. Um, so you said you actually met your wife um, performing music. Mm -hmm. how, how long did y'all perform together? Mm, we performed for that summer, uh, the summer of 89, I think that it was. And it was like almost every day for the entire summer. Okay. Um, do you remember your, uh, your first performance? My first performance uh, with a mariachi? Yes, sir. With Campanas de America, my first performance was televised, and it was a, a show called Estrellas de Texas, and that's, I'm telling you, I knew two songs, and that was my first performance. That was at the Sunken Garden Theater. What's that? What was that experience like? Oh, nerve-wracking, man. You know, you have cameras in front of you, you have microphones, you have people in the audience, and it's like exciting. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's exciting, but of course, again, nerve-wracking. Needless to say. How um, how did your groups actually go about getting booked performances? Mm, how did what? 
uh, your groups, um, so different mariachi groups that you are part of. How do you, how did y'all actually go about um, booking performances? Oh, well, we have we have a, a a manager or somebody that would take care of bookings, of course. You know, somebody that would take care of public relations and so so on. Um, with Campanas, we had uh, Bell Ortiz, which was, you know, if anyone can convince anyone for to promote mariachi music and how beautiful it is, it's Bell, you know. So we had, we, we always had work, you know. And then nowadays we have, you know, there's so many avenues that we use nowadays, like with our, my group right now, Los Galleros, our, we have our group representative, representative Ismael La Torre, and he takes care of all our bookings and all our calendar, um, and, and we do everything online now. So it's like you know, much easier to make those transactions. And there's you know different ways to pay now, so it's just easier, you know. And before people would come and see us or want to hear us play and now you can say oh just watch the video or you know we have something on YouTube so it's much easier now to you know acquire um, performances and gigs like that. Okay. Um, now you're, um, you had mentioned that you've been a part of a couple different groups. Mm -hmm. um, why, why do you think there is so much movement in mariachi music? I mean what, what leads to these uh, changes? People changing directions? People, as far as what? Um, as far as people moving between groups. Oh, uh, man, it's, it's, it's like everything else. You know, you have to have a good leader. And it, it might seem like there's a lot of groups that I played with, but every group that I've been with have, has been at least like seven years, you know. So it's not like one week and I go to another group another week or, you know, it's not like that. You know, we try to stay. I, I, at least I try to be pretty stable and stay with that group for for a good while uh, until they get rid of me or, you know, <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, no, it's, it's, but it's a beautiful experience, you know, to play with different groups. You know, you don't want to eat the same thing every day. You know, you don't want to eat hamburgers every day. You want, oh, maybe tomorrow I'll eat tacos and Wednesday I'll eat pizza or whatever, you know. So it's the same thing, you know. You play with a group, a set, uh, a, a certain uh, direction or a musical way of thinking. You know, and then this group plays this style, or this group plays this. So it's, it's a, a good, a good thing to have a little bit of everything. You know, you don't want to stay stuck in one thing. Okay. I think I don't know. <laughs> Sounds more like a learning experience. Yes, then. of course, so it oh. is a learning experience. So do you do you actually remain in contact with your previous group members? Yes, yes, of course, yes. You know, there's always collaborations. There's always. Uh, for instance, uh, Henry Gomez, I think he's one of the other uh, interviewees that they're doing uh, with Voces. He, he calls, he, he, he has found a way to uh, capture the, I guess the recording uh, part of mariachi scene in San Antonio. So if, if somebody wants to record a ranchera song or a mariachi tune, you know, 80% of the times they'll call Henry Gomez, you know, because that's the contact and he'll arrange music for, for, for instance, if you want to sing a song, say, hey, Henry, look, this is a song that I want to sing. These are the lyrics. Uh, uh, Miguel, what are the challenges to keeping a mariachi group together? The challenges to keep a mariachi group together, um, it's, uh, it's always financial, you know. Keeping your group working is important, man, you know. Uh, and uh, that was, that was uh, very much so the main purpose uh, of its survival, you know. You have to work, you have to know your skill. And in order to do that, you have to yeah, know your songs, know your repertoire, know your instrument, know, you know, the, because there's always somebody there that's either wants your job or can take your spot. Uh, keeping a mariachi group, together is work, you know, having them work. Uh, at this point in, in my life, I think I've, we've reached, I'm with uh, Los Galleros is uh, my group now that we've been together. We're going on 12 years already. Um, and with Los Galleros, it's, it's a little different. 
uh, when we started this group, my, my companion, Ismael, and I decided, he said, you know, we're going to form this group, and, and what we want to do is um, make things a little different from the experiences that we've had with other groups in, in, in our, in our in, in behind us, you know. So what we want to do is a couple of things. Um, make sure that when we come to play with the mariachi group, with Los Galleros, that we have fun. Make sure that we uh, have respect. Make sure that we put out uh, the best product that we possibly can. You know, if, um, if we have uh, problems at home or, you know, if we're upset about something, you know, we want to leave that outside. We're going to come here and we want to have fun. The time that you come and you're not comfortable or you're not enjoying what you're doing, then it's time for you to move on to do something else. And that's been the idea. Now, uh, by, by this point in time, for Los Galleros, we usually work during the weekends, and the members in our group have professional jobs or professional lives, so we don't solely depend on just performing with Los Galleros. Uh, before uh, growing up, you know, in my younger years, that's how I would support my family or my, myself and my wife, just by doing gigs, mariachi gigs, performances, and so forth. Uh, nowadays, while well, I have my teaching job, uh, my other companions, some of them are music teachers, some of them are school teachers, some of them are um, deputy sh uh, sheriff. There's also, um, well, there's two of them that are st students. One's enrolled at UT Austin and the other one's in UTRGV. Um, the, uh, we have another one. He's an engineer, uh, works for a professional company. Uh, so uh, the dynamics have changed as far as keeping this group together. So that's why I think we've had a good, a good uh, run, per se, because... Uh, we 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 don't have to depend on the mariachi to provide for our income you know we have our other side so this is a supplement at this point in our lives um so we can pay attention to rehearsals we can come uh with ease and enjoy what we're doing and that in turn i think we can uh show our public or our audience or whoever hires us that we're uh, ex uh, putting out the best quality of, of music or entertainment that we can because it's not like, oh man, I have to work or, you know, hire me and pay me and get, let me get the hell out of here, you know, it's not anything like that, you know. And not that there's anything wrong with that because we did it when we were young. We would work tables at the restaurants, you know, you have to hustle and you have to move and, but things change now, like I said, you know, we, we care about the music, we don't want to leave the music, but we want to make sure we elevate the music and give it a respect and the dignity that it deserves. So I think we are fortunate, I'm, and that's one of the things. I think in my lifetime doing mariachi music, I have been one of the most luckiest persons and fortunate persons uh, doing this because whatever I do, I really have to work at it hard. If I have to learn a song on a violin, I have to play it hundreds of times I have to learn a song singing it you know I really have to work at it and and uh, there's other people that have talent ten times more than me you know but I, I think it's my persistence and uh, and my dedication to this music and my love for this music that we want we always want to elevate mariachi music to the highest level possible okay um, so I mean so back to the question is how do you keep the mariachi together for so long well it's you know work so in in turn you know our group stays pretty busy you know because we've been able to keep those standards up they said hey hire los galleros with miguel and ismael and so forth because these guys have been around for a while and obviously they rehearse they sound good they they always seem to uh been able to produce good members or good, you know, groups and, and the stuff that we do, we, we try to do it at the highest quality and the highest, you know, possible uh, level. So that's what keeps us uh, busy 
you know, as far as performances and, and gigs. And if so if you're busy like that, you know, money's coming in and everybody's happy. You know, when you don't have that money rolling in, then there's, oh, well, I have to jump to the other place because the grass is greener over there. But that hasn't been the case. We've been, we've been successful. We've been fortunate. Okay. <coughs> so you'd mentioned at this stage <coughs> in your career, um, your goal is to elevate the music? Of course. Can you, can you kind of elaborate on that? Yeah, no, it's just, just to have a dignity and, and respect for what we do, you know. Uh, in this time in, 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 in America, you know, how, how things get, how the, the climate is as far as, you know, uh, people of color or Latinos or Mexicanos. And so we want to make sure we always give our culture the respect that it deserves. Or for people to watch, look at us and say, hey, you know, they're doing the right thing or you know we don't want them to downgrade us or look look down on us in any form or fashion so we have to make sure that if we go out there and we're wearing a traje de charro we're representing you know mexico we're representing our family we're representing our you know our neighborhood you know we're representing mariachi music and we want to make sure we represent it at the highest standard possible musically and the way we conduct ourselves the way we talk the way we you know all the, the important things that 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 will show those things. Okay, um, so you kind of alluded to um, some competitiveness there as well. Mm -hmm. You said um, there's always somebody willing to take. Oh, it's like no, it's like anything else, you know. Uh, which is competition is good. Competition is good, and uh, I my my friends, my companions, they they're all you know we're trying to do the same thing. So I mean. It's, it's always good, you know. You can't have just one group, you know. Like I said, we go back to, to food. You want to eat one thing and, and uh, you know, you, you need variety. So different groups can offer different things. I, I experienced uh, playing with a trio, which isn't necessarily mariachi. I played with Chepe Solis. He was one of the most popular uh, requinto, requintistas here in San Antonio, and he played in Mi Tierra for for years, many years. He passed away last year, unfortunately. He passed away, Chepe, last year. And um, so I had the privilege to play with him in a trio, which is totally different uh, from mariachi. It's very similar, but different. You know, voices are different, the way we harmonize. Uh, of course, there's no trumpets, there's no violins. It's uh, requinto and guitars, you know. But at that point, I was playing bass, the guitarron, and singing with him. and. Uh, so there's, you know, five, six, ten trios at Mi Tierra, you know, different groups. And I would notice that different clients preferred different trios, you know. Uh, so the, every, every trio had something to offer. Hey, we like, uh, you know, the trio de estos because, you know, they have great voices. Oh, no, we like this trio because their requinto player is on fire. Oh, we like this trio because he knows all the songs from Julio Jaramillo. Oh, no, this one knows all the Pancho songs. And so, so everybody had something to offer, you know. And the same thing with our groups. You know, in mariachi music, some people might like this group, might like this group, or so forth. You like McDonald's, you like Wendy's, you like, you know. <laughs> it, it, that's what it is. So the competition is good, you know. And, but always the, the main competition is for us to have that dignity and respect. And on, on what we're doing. Okay. So um, you had mentioned earlier in your career you were actually doing mariachi full time to mm -hmm. support you and your wife. Right. right. When did you When did you kind of make that transition over? Um, you oh, mentioned uh, teaching. Yes. Yes. As I, I started teaching uh, for SAISD as an artist in residence that they called, and then um, that that's been a wonderful experience for me. And through the experiences that I had for learning from like Los Camperos and, and uh, they would teach at conferences, at music conferences, mariachi music conferences, and, and Naticano, the director, would, would assign me to teach, you know, certain group of, of students. And I didn't have that experience, but I think he had that vision and said, you know, this guy can do this, get up there. And I'm like, okay, you know, so th those were the first initial... Uh, experiences that I had in teaching. Uh, <clears throat> but then when I was teaching with SAISD, 
uh, like I said, it was I was doing even. Oh, it's a job. Okay, let's go. You know, but then um, my group started. Uh, I started producing pretty good sounding in, uh, individuals and groups. And and at one point, my wife said, "Hey, well, you know, you might want to consider finishing your degree and go back and, you know, and say, no, okay, but I got to work. I got to put food on the table. You have you have to take care of the kids. So I was doing all sorts of things. You know, just trying to." Um, make ends meet and you know I was the only one working at that point because she was raising so my wife w has been singing professionally since she was six years old she did you know uh, she toured in Mexico as a with a circus uh, with Capulina and then she did some recordings with Mariachi Mexico uh, when she was in her uh, late teens uh, she started doing Tejano music locally with uh, a group here in San Antonio, Liberty Band, and she recorded uh, Tejano songs. And then from there, she went with Manny Music, and and she recorded four Tejano albums. She was nominated for a couple of uh, Tejano Music Awards and so forth. But once we got married, about a year and a half later, she said, you know, I, I want to start my family, so I want to stop. I don't want my kids to be on the road or blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, so let's take a break on that. So she did. So by that time, I had to, you know, she wasn't working. I had to work and, and provide for, which is my job, you know, of course. That's my job. And uh, so, you know, teaching and playing, I was doing both things and trying to, trying to, you know, do what I could. So the, the teaching experience has been wonderful, you know, through, through Naticano from Los Camperos and, and the experiences that I had with, uh, with learning from Mariachi Vargas and so forth, I was able to share those experiences with my students, and and that's been that's been pretty successful. You know, I've I've had uh, a couple of groups, uh, school groups that I worked with that have won numerous awards and competitions, and and uh, it's been good. Have uh, have any of your students actually moved on to be professional? Yes, like yes. I have, there's, well, there's lots of students that have been playing professionally. Um, so, uh, my, playing with Mariachi Los Camperos has been like the ultimate experience as a musician, as a mariachi musician. And to be able to tour with them and play and record and, and do these things with them has been awesome. But, but um, one of the other things is to be able to share those experiences with my students and then to see my students grow up and, and play with groups such as them. Uh, one of my companions, his name's Raul Cuellar, and he's locally from San Antonio, uh, younger than me, but we went kind of like through the same, you know, life cycle. You know, he started a church and on the west side, went to Lanier, blah, blah, blah. I was like, hey, man, my little brother. You know, we played together in Mariachi Los Caporales here in San Antonio. Now, he, he, he moved to Los Angeles a couple of years back, like 15 years already or so, and he's playing with Los Camperos. He's the premier voice to Los Camperos de, de Naticano, and he had been asked to play with Mariachi Vargas. He played with Mariachi Vargas for a couple of concerts, and, uh, but he, he, he decided to stay in L.A. You're talking about my students, and one of my, uh, my youngest son, Antonio, of course, I taught my three kids how to play. Uh, since an early age, and Antonio is now playing with Los Camperos in, in Los Angeles. He just turned 20 years old, and he, he moved out there in September. And, uh, yeah, he's been touring with Los Camperos. They, they just came back from Calimaya, Mexico, uh, this past weekend. They did uh, El Teatro de Goyado in Guadalajara. They did some festivals in Tecalitlan. They played in Oklahoma. I don't know where in Oklahoma, but they did a couple of... They're going to New York next weekend, uh, so they're doing a lot of concerts with a symphony orchestra, and that's what I'm telling you: the the teachings and and uh, the the expectations of Naticano, their their former uh, director. He he passed on a couple of years back, also, but that was his mentality to to elevate mariachi music and to bring it to the higher stages, not just the cantinas or the parties or the backyard parties, which nothing's wrong with that, but. We want to show that it deserves the same respect as, you know, jazz. You know, jazz was, 
in, in the bars and stuff, but now you can hear jazz at Carnegie Hall, you know, the same thing, mariachi music, we can take it to Carnegie Hall, we can take mariachi and put them in the stages with the symphonies and, and these wonderful theater, opera theater houses, and so that's what we want to do. Okay. So you mentioned um, one son is actually performing mm -hmm. uh, professionally in mm -hmm. L.A. What about, uh, what about your other two? Children? My other son, my oldest son, Miguel, uh, he is studying uh, voice, classical voice right now at BYUI, uh, Brigham Young University in Idaho. And um, he's doing really good. He's just started uh, a mariachi club in Idaho, and which is uh, unheard of, you know. Uh, they have a ballet folklorico through BYUI, and they kind of went under their umbrella uh, to start that club because they, they wouldn't allow them for, I don't know, they couldn't, I, I, I think they missed a deadline or something like that. But regardless, they, he's been the, uh, the director of that group, you know, he's gathered a couple of students, musical students, and I send them some music charts and, and they've, been, they've been reading a couple of the, the tunes and they had a performance yesterday and there, there's a, a violinist, she's a, a American, una, una muchacha, I, I don't know where she's from, but she's not, no es mexicana, not Mexican descent. Uh, una abuelita, and then uh, she said, it's funny though, because we started playing El Rey, and the first couple of song, uh, first couple of notes, we started, pam, pam, pa, pa, dum, pam, pam, and everybody's just, ah, they start yelling and screaming, and she's like freaking out, what's going on? She didn't realize that how popular it is, or how emotional this music is, and how excited the Mexicans here or the Hispanos are when they hear El Rey or Volver, Volver, you know, you play that at Market Square and people lose their minds, you know, but she never had that experience until yesterday. So he showed me a couple of videos that they had. And so he's doing that right now. He is uh, a voice major and um, he's studying voice classically, but he loves mariachi. He plays guitar, violin, guitarron. He's, his, he's a he uh, he's a composer. He does electronic music as well. Uh, he's a good kid, yeah. But he's doing good things, and I think he wants to transfer to Texas Tech uh, the following semester. But hopefully, he'll that'll be a good change for him to keep him a little closer to home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And your daughter. And my daughter uh, plays violin. She's a great violinist. Uh, she has her her. Um, I guess her, her career on hold right now, she married last year, and they're working on uh, her and her husband moving back to Texas next month. So, but she is a violinist and she sings wonderful. We recorded uh, with Los Galleros, our group, Mariachi Los Galleros de San Antonio. Last year we recorded our album, our second album, our second CD. It's called uh, La Flor Que Mas Quiero, and you can find it on Spotify or Apple Music or any of the music platforms. And, on the internet uh, and my three kids and I recorded all the violins on that on those on those uh, recordings and you can hear my sons and my daughter singing and my wife on on those recordings so check them out please check them out I'll get you a copy of that yes <laughs> we'll do we'll do so it sounds like the kids are a little little bit grown now um, but what, what was it like when they were younger? You were working, you were playing. Man, I was working and, and uh, teaching, and, and at one point, somehow I landed a gig at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center teaching the community mariachi group there. And I had to teach two groups, a beginner group and an advanced intermediate group. My wife was back at school at UTSA, or, and uh, she was trying to finish her degree uh, Antonio was my youngest, and by that time he was like four years old. You know, my wife decided to go back to school once he was able to, you know, go to school, and and she didn't want to leave him in daycare, so she waited until they were all in school. And uh, but by that point, you know, um, I had to teach, and she had to go to school in the evenings. So I bring my kids to the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center to start my classes, and my two eldest. Well, I started them on violin. Alejandra was seven years old. Miguel was uh, nine. Uh, so they would sit in the class, and Antonio would just jump around the tables and underneath the chairs, and the, the parents would take care of uh, Antonio and watch over him while I taught their kids. And after the beginner class, 
I would have the advanced class and, and my kids would stay there. So they had that instruction for me at, a, at an early age, you know. And aside from that, you know, we would go home and practice a little bit more. And uh, my wife always wanted them to continue playing music. At, at points, they, they were reluctant to play and they didn't want to play anymore. And, uh, but they didn't have a choice. They had to play, you know. And I think the, they'll thank us later on <laughs> for that. <laughs> like I did my grandmother at point. I wanted to play football. She said, you're joining band and here's the trumpet here. So that's, that's kind of what we have for them. Uh, I, I then landed another gig, so I left with the Guadalupe Cultural Arts. I went back to, with SAISD and started teaching at Austin Academy. Uh, funny thing, before I started teaching there, we enrolled our stu my, my son and daughter at, my sons and daughter at Austin Academy because they had a mariachi program there. And one of my childhood friends, Carlos Rosas Jr., was teaching there. So we, when you're, we, we enrolled him in the class in elementary, uh, great level with mariachi, what's not really heard of. The, we, you, you have middle school and high school mariachi programs, but not elementary. So we wanted them in the elementary levels to start, you know, and I knew Carlos, and I said, well, let's take them with Carlos. But when I get there, uh, the principal said, hey, Miguel, what are you doing here? I said, I, I knew the principal. And uh, she said, well, um, Carlos resigned. I said, what? I said, that's why we bring in our kids here. He said, are you looking for a job? I said, no. <laughs> he said, well, we need somebody to help us, you know, just get the ball rolling until we get somebody in here. I said, oh, okay. So I stayed with them that morning and I practiced with their mariachi students. And uh, after the class done, the secretary tells me, hey, we have money for you to come and play and work for us part time. I said, well, okay, let me think about it. So the next day, yeah, okay. She so said, wait, we have money for you to work full time. So I stayed at Austin Academy while my kids were there for the next nine years. Aside from playing mariachi music and traveling and all that, I was still teaching at, with SAISD at Austin Academy. From there, I was able to see my, my children uh, daily, go to work and have my children with me. It was a small school. It was uh, intimate. It, it was a big family. And we had a lot of uh, wonderful experiences with them and had for them to to get you know this type of instruction and have them there with me it was the best thing i'm, I'm telling you man I'm a, i was a lucky guy to have and be able to go to work and see your kids you know and be there with them so once the last one went, was out antonio went went into high school you know i stayed another year and they uh closed the the, the school the program and they combined it and consolidated some of the areas to start a super school, and so I resigned from the district for, for at that point. Okay. Yeah, sounds like you were very fortunate to spend that amount yeah, of time. Yeah, Definitely. man, it was awesome. It was awesome for them, and uh, well, you know, so yeah. <laughs> so what um, you said, you had mentioned your wife had gone back to school when mm -hmm. um, your youngest was about four. Mm -hmm. What did uh, what did she go back to school for? And yeah. eventually She's an English major. Yeah, and then, well, the thing is that she graduated and got her certification and so forth, but she couldn't land the job, you know. That was tough. And uh, she interviewed all over SAISD, and one of the former principals uh, said, hey, well, you know, we don't have an opening, but, you know, we need a, a sub. Can you come in? I mean, she said, sure. I said, hey, well, we, we need a music teacher. I see you have music credits, and... So, but you don't have your certification. So she went back and got her certification in music and she became the music teacher in SAISD at uh, Mission Academy. And she was there for, I would say like a couple of years, seven years or so. Uh, yeah, but yeah, she studied music, but she is an English major. Okay. Um, so I definitely saw the connection between your grandmother forcing music on you and you on your kids. Um, was, there, was there an impact at all um, I mean, how, how did it affect your parenting style um, with your biological parents kind of not being there? Uh, I didn't miss a beat, man. You know, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm the luckiest guy, man. I, my grandpa, grandfather and grandmother gave us everything that we needed. Uh, not that we wanted, everything that we needed. We always had food. We always had clean clothes. We always had, you know, at points we had nice clothes, you know. Uh, 
uh, love, uh, nourishment, you know, uh, encouragement. And so we, we were good. We were nourished, man. And just took those same mentalities well, to your we have stuff. To, we have to, you know, and, and good thing my wife was, uh, has a little bit more uh, uh, intellect than me. So, you know, whatever she says, you know, I try to work together with her and support her. So she said, we want our kids to do this and keep them in music. And that's what it is. And, and I felt for my kids at points because we would practice. And I think I was harder on my kids than the regular students. My kids would leave rehearsals crying and in tears. And those violins would be covered in tears because of, you know, frustration. And, but then at the end, you know, it pays off. Uh -huh. So what's... Um so aside from playing right now, what is your what is your full time career? Man, I, it, there's <laughs> playing and teaching, yeah, and being a husband. Still with SA, uh, SAISD. I, I I I just currently came back with SAISD in September. They hired me as the artist in education. So what I'm doing is I'm working with a fine arts department with um, overseeing the mariachi programs in SAISD. We want to make sure that, uh, back to what we're talking about, we want to elevate mariachi music. We want to make sure that we, uh, well, to be honest, SAISD has taken the back seat for a while. You know, all the other programs in South Texas have been booming uh, because of, you know, support. And uh, they're doing things the right way. The, and, and that's the thing that I wanted to come back to SAISD when they offered this position is because I want to make sure that we bring San Antonio back to where it belongs. You know, this is where mariachi music education started in San Antonio. This is where mariachi music education started in SAISD. And um, I was part of some of, some of that growth, and I want to give back now to to uh, to the community and, and to mariachi music, what it deserves. So I'm overseeing uh, the different schools in, in the pro all the programs in the school, making sure that we're teaching them, you know, the right things, the scales, the, uh, the proper way to play, the style, uh, making sure that, you know, we can be competitive with the orchestras and the choirs and bands, you know, for them to show us the same respect, you know, and... Uh, to be able to put out those those good sounding groups and good musicians. Great. Um, I believe I had read that you had also worked for Our Lady of the Lake in Texas State. For a yes, while. yes, yes. I I do a lot of clinician work, but I did work at, at Our Lady of the Lake for two semesters, and um, you know they they were going through transitions. They were trying to find a, a, an instructor, and at that time I was still working at SAISD at Austin Academy, so I was going after school. So it was you know, juggling, you know, the workload. And, uh, but that didn't, you know, continue since I was working also at, you know, I have a lot of teaching opportunities and uh, it's just really what I want to, at that point, what, what works for my schedule. You know, sometimes my wife says, you know, I didn't get a chance to see you. You know, we don't get time to sit down and talk or eat or, you know, because, uh, you know, I'll teach during the week and the weekends when the average person will take sa Saturday off and Sunday off. That's when we work the most, you know. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's a it's a, it's really a crazy schedule. But I love what I do, man. You know, I love what I do. So yeah, teaching at Our Lady of the Lake. I've I've clinicianed uh, different universities. Also, I've worked with. Uh, the Lubbock, my, uh, the Texas Tech, at uh, Pan Am in Rio Grande in Edinburgh, um, uh, different high school, different uh, school district, Southwest School District, uh, Harlandale School District, uh, different groups in the Valley and uh, Roma, Rio Grande, uh, you know, and then I I uh, started doing. Uh, master classes at Texas State as a consultant uh, with the mariachi program at Texas State a couple of years back. Uh, 
but in 2018, I was hired as a, a full-time faculty or part-time faculty for the Mariachi program, and that's where I'm at right now, currently at Texas State, teaching uh, Mariachi ensemble and teaching the Mariachi techniques classes, which includes vihuela, guitarron, trompeta, and and uh, violin. And uh, they're looking into having a mariachi minor and a mariachi major degree plan, for, uh, which is which will be a first in uh, anywhere, really. So we're trying to make history there too. It sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so getting back to being a mariachi specifically, um, mm -hmm. what do you? What would you say is the most difficult part of being a mariachi? The most difficult part is being away from your family. You know, like I said, being away from my wife. You know, she tells me, yeah, I remember when we were dating, you used to take me to some of your gigs, and then once we were married, you, you know, you stay at home, and you know, that was it. No, but it's just, the, the, the difficult part about being a mariachi, pff, man, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. The parties, or the fiestas, or the concerts, I don't know, man. No, it's, it's good stuff, man. Yeah. Um, does your group still add new songs to your repertoire? All the time. All the time. So that, that's a never-ending thing. You know, like I said, different groups concentrate on different things or different styles. Uh, the type of work that we do with Los Galleros uh, in San Antonio is locally. You know, we get hired for quinceañeras, bodas, funerals, uh, backyard birthday parties, barbecues. Uh, family gatherings, birthdays. So it's not so much high-end uh, productions or it's not necessarily, you know, big, huge concerts at this point. Uh, so our repertoire is, you know, the standards, you know. El Rey, Volver, Volver, De Que Manera Te Olvido, Hermoso Cariño, the Vicente Fernandez stuff. And then, of course, there's new repertoire that's coming in, you know, some of the banda, music that's kind of creeping into the mariachi scene as well but you know we have to keep up with with the pace you know uh we try to keep it as, as traditional as possible you know and that i think that's the difficult thing that's the difficult thing trying to keep it as traditional as possible and play everything with dignity you know i see uh some groups out there doing kind of crazy things you know but they want to they want their they want to find their their glitch right their niche or whatever you call it, right? Their niche, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the difficult part to 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 be able to put everything out there with with a sense of uh, dignity. Mm -hmm. okay. So how how does your group actually go about introducing new songs? Is that um, based that's off of based off of uh, normally uh, as far as a request? You know, we can go to a couple of performances and. Um, if they request for a specific song uh, a number of times, then I say, okay, we have to learn this particular song. A couple of years back, uh, we're playing performances and they would say, hey, do y'all know Un Poco Loco? I was like, oh, no, we don't. Uh, do y'all know El Poco Loco? Un Poco Loco from Coco? And no, we don't. And eventually we said, hey, guys, guess what? We have to learn Un Poco Loco. So, yeah, we added to the... But, you know, that un poco loco is not too, too, uh, too off track, you know. That's still considered, you know, Mexican music and, and uh, that can be, still be done with, with a, a sense of respect, you know. And, and, and we don't have to be embarrassed about playing something that we don't like to play. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's what we have to do with those things. So new song that comes in like that, we... We listen to the audience. We listen to our clients and say, hey, well, do you know this song from Juan Gabriel or what? And, you know, Jose Jose passed away a couple of months ago, and they started asking for a lot of Jose Jose again. I said, oh, let's go over the songs from Jose Jose or, you know, depending on what the audience wants or, or starts requesting more than often or, or we see that little trend, then we'll start adding those songs to the repertoire. But the repertoire for mariachi is endless. It's endless. That's for sure. Okay, so just have to keep up with the times a little you bit. You have then. to keep up with the pace, man, yeah. Okay. 
So it sounds like, I mean, you're mentioning that the most difficult part was always that relationship with the family. I mean, mm -hmm. how did how did you maintain that work in the multiple jobs? And Man, it's uh, it sounds like and, you didn't and sleep. <laughs> for for me, it, I, I think it's harder for it was harder for my wife. You know, it's 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 more difficult. She had to, you know, when my kids were growing up and they were younger, she they'd stay at home with her and and um, she'd go to a family gathering or and where's your husband? Oh, he has to work. He's working. Uh, my my nieces and nephews parties or you know where's Miguel well he's working he's a mariachi you know and weddings and stuff like that well where's Miguel he's working my wife so my wife was the one that really suffered in that sense and I I, I really feel feel bad for for not being there for her you know and that's that's the difficult part and then you know the times that she didn't have a, a party to go to or something and I would have to work and she would stay home with the kids. They would ha they'd, they'd always have a, a fun activity to do. They'd go, I don't know, she'd give them like $5 and say, let's go to the dollar store and, you know, this is your allowance and whatever. Or they go to the movies or they go out to eat somewhere that I didn't prefer to eat, but they liked to go. And so they would do fun stuff like that. But then when they started playing with me, she was all by her lonesome again, so <laughs> that's the hard part. I felt for my wife, but she's still there with me, and that's the beautiful thing. It sounds like you need a very understanding partner. Then. Oh, yes, definitely. And even considering that she is a musician herself, so she knows what it is and what it takes, even like that, it's not difficult. I mean, it's not easy. It is still difficult for her. I, yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, what were uh, what were some of your most memorable performances? I know you've uh, played at the Tonight Show, Linder mm -hmm, Center, yeah. uh, Tejano Music Awards. Yeah, I think the most memorable. Uh, there's two uh, venues that we played at. Uh, the the ultimate for me was being able to play with Mariachi Los Camperos at El Teatro de Goyado, and that's in uh, Guadalajara. They have, el, they call it el, el Encuentro de Mariachi y Charrería. And it's been in existence for about over 20 years. That's where they showcase the highest level of mariachi musicians in the world. Mariachi Vargas, Mariachi Los Camperos, Mariachi América de Jose, Jesús Rodríguez de Ijar. And they, aside from the set that they play by themselves as a, as a mariachi ensemble, they also get to play accompanied by the symphony so this is something you know out of this world to be able to hear mariachi music with the symphony it's what we're talking about elevating the mariachi music to that higher level and giving mariachi music the, that respect you're so you're playing at an opera house beautiful venue in el, el degollado and uh, to be able to hear mariachi music played at its finest that i think and people sitting in the audience being able to appreciate that and playing in Mexico and Guadalajara where mariachis are from, you know, that I think that was one of the ultimate experiences. And I've had a couple of times that we went, I, I didn't go just one year, I, I went multiple times to play, but that has been the, the, the highlight of, of playing with a mariachi uh, group with Los Camperos. And the other one has to be being able to accompany uh, Placido Domingo. And we accompany Placido Domingo here in San Antonio. He's been here twice. Uh, the first time it was, uh, I think it was in 2006 at the Alamo Dome. And then a couple of years later, we did it at the AT&T Center with the symphony and, and being able to accompany with Mariachi Los Galleros, uh, uh, Placido Domingo with the symphony. That has been one of the ultimate performances. And, and just one more. Being able to play alongside with my son and daughters, my, my sons and daughter, uh, is always, you know, any time that we play together and having them there by my side is, is the ultimate experiences as well. Do you plan to eventually maybe uh, form your own group with your, with your uh, children? Well, that's what it was. Yeah, <laughs> Los Galleros, yeah. Yeah, they, they joined our, our group, but you know, um, Miguel moved on to, to study, and Antonio is now playing with Los Camperos in Los Angeles, and so he moved out uh, a couple of months ago, like in September, so I don't know if that's going to happen again, but who knows.
Now, how do you feel? Uh, how do you feel about interacting with the audience at these performances? Oh well, it's it's challenging sometimes interacting with the audience. As far as like I like I said, you know, our 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 performances locally are not high. Um, you know those uh, concerts, or you know, it, it's normally like a quinceañera, a backyard barbecue and and those are the type of uh, an anniversary and you know the interaction is 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 the same thing we want our audience to respect respect us and how do you do that well you have to give yourself that respect you don't want to arrive to the to the performance drunk you don't want to arrive to the performance not dressed dressed properly you don't want to arrive with a performance unprepared so when we arrive to the performance, we want to make sure that everyone's dressed the same way. We have the same uniform. We want to make sure if we play something, it's well rehearsed. We want to make sure that uh, we'll not get there, you know, or get there and, and eat and drink and, you know, take. No, they're, they invited, they're hiring you to do a job. So that's what we want to do. So those are the things that are important that we want to make sure that. So interacting with your audience, of course, again, you know, sometimes you don't have to to preach uh, to the audience, but the way you conduct yourselves can say, oh, okay, these guys know what they're doing, okay? If you get there and you're, ah, todo esto y borrachos y todo eso, then they, you lose their respect. So we want to lose their respect. And when somebody starts, hey, que estoy lo de esta canción y todo, you know, you kind of ignore them, and then they kind of get the, the understanding, and you go up to it. What song would you like to hear? This one, okay, yes, we'll play it for you. And oh, okay, there, you know, just that's the interaction that we have. And the other, well, you know, people want to hear this music, and and like I said, you know, this is passionate music. So people will yell and scream, and they'll sing along with you. And this is that's part of it. You know, they'll dance to this music, they'll sing to this music, they'll cry. You know, they'll bring out memories for people that live in Mexico, I can't go back to Mexico, and you play Mexico Lindo y Querido, and the tears will start rolling. You know, you play Amor Eterno, and they'll remember their mom or dad died, and they cry. Or you hear a song, and you, oh, I remember my old girlfriend, and, you know, whatever it is, or boyfriend, that's, that's mariachi music, you know. If it doesn't hit you here, then it's not real music. It's not real mariachi music. <laughs> Speaking of songs, what's your favorite song? Oh man, don't that's that's too broad, you know. Speaking of of songs, there's so many so many genres. I I can't categorize. There's songs were for male singers, female singers, mariachi ensembles, uh, the style of songs. There's so many styles in mariachi genre that that um, that's that's too broad to answer. Uh, of course. El Son de la Negra has to be a song that every mariachi should know. So I, you have to select something. It has to be El Son de la Negra. Okay. Um, now that concert you were talking about in uh, Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. um, how did the how did the Mexicans actually be, or um, how did they actually view you when you played in Mexico? Not being from Mexico. Well, that's they announced the 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 majority of the members are from Mexico, uh, but they reside in Los Angeles. And it was just like maybe uh, two or like two of us that that were pochos, verdad? Uh, Mexican descent, but born in the United States. So they didn't realize that we we're even, you know, uh, not from Mexico. But you know, uh, they're all we're all from Mexican descent. So my grandfather uh, Rufino was born in Texas, and. And doing the our genealogy, we I on my father's side, uh, we we've been here for I don't know a couple of gen five generations or so. And um, since my parents divorced when I was young, I didn't keep too much uh, information with my mom as far as our family on my maternal side. Uh, Maybe two years ago, talking with my mom, I asked, oh, where's, you know, where's my grandpa from? And he said, well, he's from Jalisco. And he said, what? You never told me this. He said, yeah, your, your grandpa's from Jalostotitlan. 
Halos, they call it Halos. And Jalisco is known for two things, no, three things. Tequila, mariachi, and beautiful women, right? So, yeah, so Jalisco, and it's like, man, my family's from Jalisco. My grandfather was born in Jalostotitlan. So I go back and started doing the genealogy on see where they're from. And sure enough, my grandfather, his father, like, I don't know, like 13 generations have been in Jalostotitlan, Jalisco, uh, looking at the family tree. Uh, they've been living there for about 300 years. My grandfather came to the United States uh, when he was young and he died here back in 1974. Well, I remember my grandfather vaguely because I was very young. But uh, yeah, so my family's, my, my, the descents are from Jalisco. So that's where mariachi music is from. So, I mean, I finally said, oh, okay, good, because my grandfather was from Texas, you know, my great grandfather was from on my dad's side and they're like, how do you, well, people would ask me, well, how do you know mariachi music? I said, I don't know, man, I learned it in school. But are you from Mexico? And I saw, I'm from the west side of San Antonio. Well, how do you make that connection? I said, I don't know, man. I didn't know, you know, until, well, my, my mom says, oh yeah, your grandpa's from Jalisco. I said, oh, okay, then, then I have a, some type of a link there. You know, so that that was that was a a nice experience to know that our 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 ancestors are from from the state of Jalisco, from Mexico. But like I said, they came at an early age, and um, you know uh, we we lost contact with that side of the family. So last August, uh, when my son played in Guadalajara. My wife and I took a, a trip to Jalisco, and we traveled, and we went to Jalostotitlan to visit my my grandfather's uh, pueblo. Uh, beautiful, and of course, they say the women are there are, are the most beautiful women in the world, and I believe it. <laughs> they are, so they have a lot of uh, Spanish and, and French descent. So, you know, beautiful green, blue eyes, light complected, and muy bonitas. So, uh, yeah, uh, being from this side and, and people talk to me and say, well, where did you learn Spanish? How do you speak Spanish so well? I said, well, I didn't study Spanish in school, but uh, through the music I learned how to read and write and speak Spanish through mariachi music. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did you, uh, did you pass Spanish on to your children? Yes. So... Um, Initially, that was the language that we wanted to teach our, our children. So since they were born, agua, mama, papa, you know, you know, everything was Spanish until they entered kindergarten or pre-K, and then everything is English from there on, you know. And we tried, we still, I still speak to my kids in Spanish at home. That uh, My wife will speak to them in English. But, you know, it, and it's like, you know, the reference to the Selena movie, you have to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and you have to be more American than the Americans, you know, so I have to deal with that, you know. And um, coincidentally, my wife, uh, aside from being a singer, she is also a composer and she wrote a song called El Huérfano, El Huérfano Sin País, and it talks about um, a person like me that lives in the United States, that's from Mexican descent, but is seen by the Americans as a Mexican or a Latino, right? But the Mexicans see me as a pocho. So I'm not from over there, but I'm not from over here either way. So we're like, you know, man, come on. You feel like a huérfano. You feel like an orphan, man. And that's her song, El Huérfano Sin País. No. And uh, you have to listen to that, El Huérfano. It's in our first album, De Los Galleros. Yeah, it's an impactful song. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of an identity struggle. There. Yeah, it is, man. So in, in trying to maintain that respect, I mean, definitely trying to straddle that line between both sides. Um, have you seen, I mean, have you seen a decline in respect for mariachis? I mean, or no, the no, 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 not at all, man. There's been a push through the school system for mariachi programs that are growing so much. Uh, through these competitions that they have at the state level, at the regional levels. Uh, currently, I'm teaching at Texas State University, and we're thinking about 
you know, they're thinking about and planning on mariachi music degrees, and all this stuff has to be approved by boards and, you know, the state and so forth, and, and it's happening. It's happening. So as far as respect, you know, I think we're, we're, we're on the right track. You know, we're working towards that. Um, now, I know you're teaching, so you're teaching right now. Mm -hmm. you're, you've already taught this craft to you know, your children as mm -hmm. well. Do you plan to continue teaching? I think so, man. <laughs> I think so. Uh, the, the other thing that I love to do is, of course, to play my instrument or play mariachi music. Uh, any opportunity that I get, I, I want to play an instrument. But to continue teaching, I think so. Uh, what's in store for me in the future? I don't know, man. Uh, retirement. And if I do, I'll still teach, you know. I, I, five years ago, no, about eight years ago, uh, what are we? No, about five years ago, uh, between uh, Austin Academy, when I finished, I, I resigned from SAISD before I came back to Austin. I, the, there was a little period where I, uh, I began my own music school uh, or my own music students, private students. It's called the Miguel Guzman Mariachi Conservatory. And um, I would teach out of my home. And, uh, you know, I... So even, even when I'm not working, I'm working at home. And so, yeah, the question is, will you continue? I think I'll continue teaching, yeah. So at this point in your career, what advice do you have for future mariachis? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just to everything that you're doing to 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 give it the respect that it deserves, you know, to elevate always to the highest quality that you can. Prepare yourselves, you know, prepare yourselves musically, and uh, you know, to show that that this music is it deserves its respect. Circling back to uh, circling back a little bit to family life, mm -hmm. um, when and how did you actually start to regain that contact with your mother? Um, uh, I don't know. You know, um, my pa like I said, my parents divorced, and, and we kind of lost contact with her for for years. And then um, I don't know, man. Once the grand grandkids started popping up, you know. You know, I think they somehow made contact with my mom again, and uh, but it's it, it you know she she she's still alive, uh, and uh, but we didn't have that relationship with her, you know, as we did with my grandmother. Yeah, has that uh, has that relationship evolved a little bit, or uh, not really? You know, because there were so many. Um, uh, I, I don't know we. The, the the communication wasn't there and uh, uh, I you know she's my mom she gave birth to me and stuff and I, I see her like uh, an aunt per se you know my grandmother was the one that that raised us and I, I I'm so thankful to my mom that she was able to say I can't take care of my kids at this point in my life and my grandmother said okay I, I'll, I'll take them it was either that or the state you know so I appreciate my mom you know, uh, having having that sense to say, here, take them. And, uh, and uh, well, yeah, man, I, I was, again, I was fortunate, you know, to have my grandmother there nourish me and my grandfather. So along with that, my, my aunt Susie, who was my brother, my dad's sister, never married. So she lived with my grandmother and she helped us, helped my grandmother raise us as well. She never had any kids, so we saw her as another mom, you know. And like I said, we never needed anything. We were always clean. My, my aunt worked at a, a department store downtown. It's called Frost Brothers. It's more like a, a Dillard's or a Macy's. So anytime there was specials on clothes and everything, so she always dressed us up like with the nicest clothes. I'm telling you, we were wearing Ralph Lauren and you know, polo and Gucci and like, and living in the West Side, you know, and said, hey, these kids, what are y'all selling drugs? Not yet, but you know, <laughs> but my aunt provided for us as well. So, you know, my aunt Susie was an angel as well. You know, she didn't have kids, so she helped my grandmother raise us. You know, so, you know, thankful for that too. Strong family ties. Yeah. 
You had um, you'd also mentioned wanting to have that line to Jalisco. Why was that? Why was that important for you? Jalisco is the uh, Cocula and Jalisco and all that area. That's where the birthplace of mariachi is. You know, that's where mariachi, you know, evolved from. And um, you know, uh, particularly in in Coahuila and, and Co I mean Cotul. Cocula, perdón, en Cocula, en Guadalajara, all those areas in Jalisco, that's where, where mariachi music is from. I mean, I know the northern part of Jalisco, where my grandfather's from, is a little bit further up, but it's still Jalisco. So it's, it just felt like a sense of, like I said, identity. And I can say, okay, my grandfather is from Jalisco. Before, I didn't know where would I go. I'm not from Mexico. I'm not from over here. Why, why in the hell are you playing mariachi music? You know, where does that come from? I don't know. Now I kind of like, okay, I have a sense of identity. And that's, you know, for me, that's important. You know, and, and even so, I used to play with other uh, guys from Mexico. And she said, hey, where, where's your family from? Uh, we're from Texas. <laughs> you know, like, how the hell are you from Texas? And you're playing and singing and, you know, in Spanish and mariachi music. And, you know, we're from, but now I can say, okay. My grandfather from Jalisco. Mm -hmm. okay. So you had mentioned um, you'll probably continue to teach. What mm -hmm. about performing? Performing as, yeah, well, that's, that goes hand in hand. That goes hand in hand. You know, family gatherings, you know, we get together. Hey, hey, let's sit down and eat. And after we're done eating, first thing, take out the guitar. Okay, sing. You sing. You sing. ¿A cuál vas a cantar? A cantar esta. Órale, vámonos. It never stops, man. Yeah, that's always. And you know, m somebody will go live on on Facebook, and they're like, "Hey, when are you gonna invite us to one of your gatherings? We want to be there with you guys, singing and playing." And uh, we're like, you know, it's just spontaneous. It, we don't plan for this, you know. It just happens. Yeah. Great. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to add, Miguel? Uh, mariachi music has, has changed my life. Uh, that's for sure. You know, my, my sense of direction, uh, the, the way I thought my life was going to be. I, I, my, grandpa, my, grandpa, my grandfather and grandmother wanted me to pursue engineering and, and uh, you know, be an architect and... And then at one point, I, I really thought I was going to be in the military. My uncles were in the Army. Another, my aunt was in the Air Force, and the other ones in the Marines. I, I definitely thought I was going to be enrolled in the Marines. Uh, joining Mariachi, that kind of like took me a different path uh, for the better, for the worse. But, you know, uh, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would be supporting my family through Mariachi music. And now, this is this is my life, you know, supporting uh, and uh, my family and making this my living through through mariachi music, teaching, performing, uh, and sharing those experiences that I've had through the years through through these years, and uh, and being able to share that with my kids now. And I see Antonio uh, and and my son Miguel doing the same. You know, they're they're planting those seeds. And uh, trying to keep mariachi music, mariachi music's not going to die anytime soon. That's for sure. Uh, but to do it with dignity and in a respectful way, that's that's what we want to do. Uh, I'll think I'll continue doing this. Like I said, even after I retire, I I have plans already. I'm thinking the future, but I can't tell you right now because then you'll know. <laughs> no, but you know, my wife and I have thought about it, a couple of things on retirement, but I, even after retirement, I'll, I'll probably continue teaching, you know, continue with my schooling and teaching private students. And it's just the love, man. You can't, you can't leave it, you know. But again, it's the way you do it and, and honorable and uh, keeping the culture alive, you know. It's so part, so much of our, our lives that we have to, it, you can't leave it, you know. Yeah, I can definitely, I can definitely see that love mm -hmm. and that passion for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, that's all I have on my answer. I want to. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, uh, yeah, would you like to introduce the instrument that you brought with you oh, today? Oh, yeah. I'll grab that for you. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. I'm sorry. So this is, of course, like anything else, you have to warm up and and uh, do some finger exercise. It's so early. So this is a, the, a violin, and and for mariachi, the violin um, serves its purpose as a melodic instrument. It it provides melody. It provides um, uh, the musical theme or the musical line, right? The the melody. Uh, and uh, it's the same instrument. Some people say, what's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? Well, it's the same instrument. It's just the style of music that you're playing. The wonderful thing about my, uh, of, of the violin that you can play, you can play... Uh, you can play classical music, right? You can play classical music, but then... For mariachi, it's a lot different, right? Because All right? It just sounds happy and fun, right? Well, that's mariachi music. And um, you know, the wonderful thing is that we can have the violin to be able to play different styles of music. but. Uh, yeah, this is this is El Violin. Anything else? That is it, sir. Thank you uh, for taking the time to meet with us today. Mr. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you.